Hello, Sean. How are you, my friend? Good. How are you, Ken? Good, buddy. It's good to hear your voice. Yeah, likewise. It's been a while since we've connected one-on-one. Indeed. And looking forward to today's conversation. Yeah, um, likewise. Yeah, which is basically about integral ecology. And you and Michael Zimmerman, with some considerable input from myself, yeah. have a book coming out soon on just this topic. And it will be the first major text on integral ecology. And I know you're very excited about that. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's um, literally been 10 years in the making, so I can't wait for it to actually get out and be available for people to check out. Yeah, exactly. And I'm you know, very eager for it to come out as well because it's one of the first you know, major applications of the integral or aqua model to a discipline, focusing specifically on the terminology in the fields of that discipline. Yeah. So, you know, as you know, one of the problems using my books as textbooks is if somebody in ecology or history or even art wants to use sex, ecology, spirituality as a textbook, the problem is there's all sorts of people in it. There's St. Teresa and Zen and Vedanta and Spinoza and (laughs) Plotinus, and so it it kind of has a hard time getting past the academic board allowing texts in a particular field. So this is one that really just focuses on ecology itself. Um, yeah, and one and, of our big hopes with with this, as you've mentioned, you know, it's really the the first kind of substantial application of the integral model to a particular discipline, and we wrote it in a way that we feel will actually inspire and hopefully, you know, guide other individuals with applying the integral model to other disciplines. Right. So, so in a sense, it, I think the book can also serve as a template for how other academics and scholar practitioners can, you know, take the integral model that you've developed and drill it deeply into a discipline using the terms, concepts, and theories found within that discipline and its associated fields. Right, right. And not just professionals, of course, although this is a textbook, it is written with a degree of complexity, but even lay people, once they get into the field, once they start studying the integral model or the aqua framework, it looks daunting at first, but it actually becomes a relatively simple framework that can be applied to literally any aspect of experience. And so lay people who get into it also tend to find the approach really, really useful because it gives enough complexity to actually be comprehensive, to actually claim to include virtually all of the major approaches to a topic and to include it in a relatively straightforward and believable and testable fashion. Yeah. So we find, for example, if you ask the average person how many schools of ecology are there, they probably would say something like, oh, there's five or six, maybe a dozen at most. In fact, as you pointed out in this book, there's over 200 major and minor schools of ecology. Yeah, that's pretty wild. <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> but what it does point out in a certain sense is the inadequacy of any one of them. Yeah, There are that many schools precisely because there are that many different types of elements that need to be included in any sort of comprehensive theory. And so finding a way to shake these 200 elements down into, let's say, a half dozen you know, major elements that can then be combined in various ways to give rise to these 200 schools is one of the claims that integral ecology makes. Yeah, totally. And I think one of the other things that comes out of recognizing that there are you know, 200 you know, perspectives that need to be considered within this context is to paraphrase a question you've posed is what kind of cosmos do we live in such that there are 200 distinct and valuable perspectives on the natural world right you know and it's it just really invokes a, a humble sense of awe right you know that nature 
little n, capital N, or all caps N is such that there's a need for 200, and there's no indication that we've maxed out. You know, exactly. like, you know, when you look at the dates on when those perspectives, you know, first came forward, you see an exponential curve, you know, of you know a handful appearing in the early 1900s. Right. Um, you know, a dozen starting to merge in the 50s, you know, um, 30 to 50 emerging in the 60s and 70s. And then from the 80s to now, you see, you know, 100 plus entering the scene. And there's every indication that the 200 perspectives that we've identified now as being relevant to an integral approach to ecology and environmental studies is going to be 300, 400, 500 in the next 100 years. Right. You know, so the integral model, by having it in place now, actually helps us preemptively, you know, deal yeah. with <laughs> the, the the explosion of perspectives and considerations that are very likely to become part of the many discourses out there right. related to environmental issues. Right. And as is so often the case with the integral model, you can, as you point out, basically reverse engineer the integral framework based on the number and types of human disciplines we find. Yeah. So it's what does the universe have to look like in order that 200 believable schools of ecology could be generated by serious men and women with a great deal of evidence and you know deductive logic and support and so on for them. And the answer is that, well, it's the universe that has at least quadrants, levels, lines, states, types, and other aspects of the integral model, and in basically mixing and matching those fundamental elements of the framework, which are also fundamental elements of the universe, yeah. you can then generate these different schools. Right. And, and so one of the things we want to do here today is go through this, and in a sort of an intermediate level fashion. In other right. words, this won't be introductory, although um, somebody who's coming on this the first time, we hope, will explain stuff and get them up to speed. So uh, even if you're unfamiliar with any of the integral terms, that won't slow you down. But we are going to go into it in a fair amount of detail. And so we can start out with a definition of integral ecology itself, and the shortest, simplest definition is it's the application of integral theory, of the integral framework, to the field of ecology itself. Yeah. And so then we need to say, well, what is the integral framework? And let me read, actually, the first paragraph that you've included on this PDF. Thus, in an integral context, the classical definition of ecology, parenthesis, the study of the interrelationship between organisms and their environment, end parenthesis, becomes the study of the interrelationship between organisms' behaviors and experiences and their cultural and natural environments. Those are reflecting the four major quadrants of the interior and exterior of the individual and the collective. So then it goes on, in other words, integral ecology is the mixed methods study of the subjective and objective aspects of organisms in relationship to their intersubjective and interobjective environment. In fact, we can use the classical definition of ecology as long as we understand that by organism, we mean an individual whole-on with subjectivity, and by environment, we mean a collective whole-on with intersubjectivity. Thus, integral ecology doesn't require a new definition of ecology as much as it needs an integral interpretation of the standard definitions of ecology, where organisms and their environments are recognized as having interiority. And that's probably as good a place to start as any is that it's uh, integral ecology is essentially very similar to conventional ecology, except it includes interiority and two important types of interiority, the interiors of animals as well as the interiors of humans. Yeah. A lot of people say that's what makes it fun. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, often when I'm kind of giving the elevator pitch of what integral ecology is, I, I emphasize that which you just spoke to, that it's an approach to ecology that really 
includes, you know, human psychology and the interiors of humans and, and how we respond to environmental disasters and crises and situations and, right. and recognize the role that psychology and culture at the human level plays in creating and, and dealing with environmental and ecological realities. And that's what a lot of the, you know, kind of whole so-called holistic approaches to right. um, ecology and environment have, have done and championed. But then it also, and this is one of the things that makes it very radical, in my opinion, and really sets it apart from pretty much anything else that's out there, it includes the interiors of organisms. Right. And, you know, there's various traditions like panpsychism, for instance, that do that. And, and there's a lot of holistic approaches to ecology that say that's important, and we're glad there's panpsychists out there, and we think we should, you know, learn something from them. And, and so there's, within a lot of holistic approaches, there's a recognition of the value of including the interiors of organisms. But integral ecology actually provides a way of doing that, a right. way of really systematically saying, you know, hey, you know, clearly organisms are members of ecosystems, and as members of ecosystems, they have a range of interior experience that right. is, is worth noting and, and striving to understand and make sense of and to be in relationship to. And so integral ecologies, as far as I can tell, is really the only approach to ecology that takes very serious the insight that members of an ecosystem have interiors. Right. Um, and, and even that phrase right there, as you know, because I've taken it from you, just by recognizing that they're members opposed to parts right. is an important step in recognizing the interior dimension of, of them as part of a collective. Right. And even if we take the panpsychists, like Whitehead, for example, Whitehead maintains that basically all individuals, all individual occasions have interiors with a type of proto-feeling or proto-awareness that he called prehension, and that that goes all the way down. No. So he said, for example, that physics is a study of small organisms and biology is a study of big organisms. Yeah, love that. Yeah, but we add a further little twist to that, which is that subjectivity and objectivity are also always part of an intersubjectivity and interobjectivity. Yeah. That there's not just the interior and the exterior of an occasion, that occasions always exist in collectives, that there's just no such thing as a singular without a plural. And so this is where we come up with four quadrants. And these four quadrants are, again, the inside and outside of the singular and the plural. And so we maintain that not only do the exterior quadrants represented by pronouns such as it and its, and by occasions such as an organism, molecules, cells, atoms, quarks, those go all the way down. In other words, all the way down to the smallest units, and pretty much every natural scientist believes that. But we maintain that, that the prehension of all of those goes all the way down. Yeah, exactly. And so that gives a very symmetrical universe for us, number one, in that there's a kind of what we also sometimes call tetrahension or tetraprehension. But these are items that can be specified very clearly and that there are methodologies that deal with them very straightforwardly. And so it also takes care of the mind-body problem because that's the relation of that is just inherently explained by four quadrants. And it's a very parsimonious system to handle a large part of those factors leading to 200 different schools of ecology. But part of what's irreducible on these 200 schools is consciousness, awareness, inside, outside, singular, and plural. No. And so that's what the quadrants do. And we'll be discussing the quadrants throughout this conversation. And just so people understand, I'll give a quick example, because quadrants are also sometimes very loosely identified with first, second, and third person perspectives. And I say loosely because technically there's only the interior and exterior of holons. And a second person perspective is really just a first person plural perspective. It's an inside of two subjects that are mutually resonating. 
And then, of course, there are second persons, and they have their own four-quadrant diagram, and there are third persons, they have their own four-quadrant diagram, and so on. But it's loosely sometimes referred to as first, second, and third person. And first person is defined as the person who is speaking. So right now I'm first person, and you are second person. Second person is defined as the person being spoken to. And in third person is the person or thing being spoken about. So those are first person perspective, second person perspective, and third person perspectives. There's also fourth person perspectives and fifth person perspectives. And those are generated with just reiterations of the interior and exterior perspectives. So that's why we don't equate the quadrants with first, second, and third person. But as a loose introduction, it works fine. And they are there. These quadrants are there. First, second, and third person perspectives are there. First, second, and third person pronouns occur in all major world languages, reflecting the reality of these perspectives. And the point about integral theory is that every occasion, every moment of experience, every what White had called drop of experience, has not just subjectivity and objectivity, but all four perspectives built into it, dimensions built into it, and all the way down. So that gives us a uh, sort of a direct way of dealing with these these issues. And what's happening right now, the way four quadrants are being generated in this conversation, for example, is you have an interior first person represented by your own I, pronoun I, and then I have a an interior, and we have two I's talking to each other, and that generates, when I'm talking to you, you are a you, pronoun you are a thou, right. and when you're talking to me, I'm a thou, and an I plus a thou equals a we. So you and I continuing to talk and and having mutual understanding and a mutual resonance build up a we. And that thou is second person and the continual building up of first and second person mutual understandings gives first person plural or we. So there's not just an I that's occurring in these conversations. But there are two eyes that go together to make up a we. And this we is the interior of the collective that you and I represent in this conversation. Now, while we're having this conversation, my I is embedded. It's in an objective organism. The objective organism can be approached by third-person science. So there's a, it has a triune brain and a reptilian brain stem and it has molecules and cells and neurotransmitters and so on. And as I talk, my voice box generates sound patterns. These sound patterns also are third person objects and they travel across this phone line, which is a third person object. We looked at it as a third person object to you, goes into your ear, into your brain, all as a third person series of its. And there in your brain, is converted to a series of signifieds and a series of I understand. And so my I is generating an idea. It's going across my own individual it or organism through a system of its into your it or organism. And there it's being converted into an I. So there's an I, a we, an it, and an its. And this happens in every single occasion of reality because the sentient beings go all the way down so even electrons are communicating resonating and generating four quadrants as they interact with holons at their own level of development so these four quadrants are really kind of central to integral theory and let us follow a whole lot of transactions that other schools would tend to dismiss. Yeah, precisely. And, and one of the biggest problems, for example, is systems theory, which is third person collective exteriors and is described in it language and is in the lower right quadrant. And systems theory claims to be holistic, claims to be all comprehensive, and of course is the basis of many eco theories. 
but systems theory doesn't cover itself the interiors. It doesn't actually give you methods for contacting the I or the we or understanding or resonating with the I or the we, techniques for understanding a we, interpretation and hermeneutics, for example. And the hermeneutics is not included in standard systems theory, nor are things like poetry or value. So you can read any textbook on systems theory and not find anything on beauty, on spirituality, on anything having to do with interiors. So we claim that systems theory is correct when it's covering the exterior of collectives, but that it leaves out interiors. Yeah. And one of the problems, again, with many of the schools of uh, ecology leaving out the interiors. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and so many of the, you know, the holistic approaches to ecology, I mean, one thing that becomes really clear when you consider the 200 perspectives that are listed in the appendix is it's like, okay, so so you're a holistic approach to ecology. All right, well, tell me of these 200 perspectives, which ones are you including and which ones are you not even aware of? <laughs> right. You know? And it's like so often it's like those holistic approaches are only including, you know, at the most a dozen of the 200. And so that quickly becomes a way of differentiating, you know, so-called integrative or holistic approaches with, you know, the integral approach. And another way that I often think of this is a lot of holistic approaches are like philosophically integral in the sense that there's there's an impulse to include. Right. Like they really genuinely want to include interiors. They really right. genuinely want to include science and systems theory and culture and spirituality. Like so, you know, they're there with us in that regard, but and but it ends up being a heap. They have like a philosophical heap right. of, of these approaches, and they're not clear on the appropriate ways of understanding the relationship between these. Right. And and so they're not methodologically integral. Um, right. They don't recognize the methodological dimensions and the inactive dimensions between, you know, for instance, the upper left and an individual's interior and a sense of interconnection with how that is and isn't similar to lower right forms and understandings of interconnection and, right. you know, the realm of systems. Right. And so, you know, it's almost as if integral theory provides an artifact where, you know, the holistic approaches only have a heap. Right. Right. And that artifact is itself woven into a framework that explicitly shows how these different dimensions relate to each other. No. and gives an account for that and gives an account for their evolution as well. So it's it's a, a tightly woven artifact that accounts for individual holons, social holons, and artifacts. Yeah, and so often the conversation, in my experience, goes something like this, like <laughs> me talking with, you know, a, a deep ecologist or a holistic, you know, environmental um, person. It's like me saying, you know, but actually you don't, really include interiors and them saying but I really really want to and I'm trying yeah <laughs> and me saying yeah I understand that and I'm I'm excited and I get that and the way you're going about it actually doesn't do it right <laughs> you know? right and and even those that explicitly sort of articulate or make verbal room for interiors don't understand and don't make room for the types of methodologies that actually get at interiors. Yeah. So they'll give a third per they'll say, well, it's important to include the good, the true, and the beautiful. It's important to include first, second, and third person approaches to reality, and then they'll write entire texts on why it's important to include first, second, and third person approaches to reality. But that entire text is third person approach. No. They've just asserted that first and second person approaches are important, but they don't tell you how. Yeah. They get in touch with those, and they don't include those methodologies as part of what you have to do in right. order to have an integral consciousness and approach reality in an integral, truly integral fashion. Yeah. So it's not. It's I sometimes hear a lot, as you know, that you know this is just it's just a cognitive thing. That the integral approach is just merely cognitive. It's just a map, but it certainly is a map of reality. But there are places in the map that says this point right here is to be known directly. You cannot know this by using a map. To know this, you must 
do meditation, or to know this you must do phenomenology, or to know this you must do, and so on. So it actually, or this you must be more in touch with the body. And so the map includes areas that explicitly say, you know, a map won't work here. Yeah. Yeah, I often, in working with students here at JFK and fielding, you know, when it's someone points out uh, integral a map, I often will respond and say, yeah, it's a third-person map, but it's also a second-person um, shared language that allows a new and different kind of conversation to occur between disciplines that have otherwise been cut off from each other. It right. provides a, a, a meta-language that can bridge um, these various approaches, and it's also a first-person set of practices. Right. You know, so the, the integral model is practices, lang you know, a, a framework or language right. and a map. You know, so right. it's all three, and, and all three of those are recursively informing each other, right. um, you know, and, and tetrameshing. Um, right. And one of the things that I really love about the book that Michael and I have done is there's a whole chapter uh, in which I um, develop and present, you know, over a dozen practices, um, right. you know, a, a yoga of integral ecology, if you will, yeah. um, and that, you know, use the, the quadrants and the levels and, and different aspects of the integral model and say, you know, here are some practices. Here's a way of working with your first-person awareness and your second-person experience of the natural world such that you can actually cultivate an integral understanding that's anchored in your own embodied self right. that will give you illumination into this map that we're talking about. Right, right, which is a really important point. And as you also well know, integral theory itself, theoria, includes an analysis of all types of knowledge and concludes that good knowledge in all fields rests on an initial practice, an initial injunction, no. an initial activity. It's all of the form, if you want to know this, you must do this. And so it's even the theoretical components are anchored in practices and explicitly stated as such. And then in many cases, as you have done, actually give the practices and say, when I love the you know integral ecological yoga, for example, yeah. is a beautiful way of thinking about what integral ecology does. And so one of those three steps that you mentioned is, uh, of course, the map and, and learning the map. And that's necessary only in the extent that we would say, for example, in doing yoga, you have to learn the asanas. You have yeah. to actually learn what these postures are, and you have to study what those are, and you have to memorize the patterns, and then, then you go do them. Yeah. And so integral ecology is an activity as much as it's anything. And I think that's one of the things that makes it fun when you actually get it and get over a little bit of the, you know, cognitive weight of the material. Yeah. Uh, you realize that it's really based on a whole series of practices. And that's fairly unique also.